Welcome to the Lou Riley Live Show, a podcast about health, wellness, motivation, and success. Now, here's your host, Mr. Lou Riley. Well, how about it? Let's give it up one time for the band. Hey, folks, this is Lou Riley coming at you bright and early on a Tuesday morning, July 23rd, 2013. Fresh off a double DDP yoga workout. Had a good time for it. It's a good time of year. You know, football's back. My Dallas Cowboys are in training camp. Had some mishaps on the first day or so, but, you know, it's a long season. Let's hope for the best. And once again... I think this is our year. (laughs) So let me go ahead and get into our topic. Don't want to burn all of your time on on, on my rants. But today I'm just thinking in terms of, do you have anybody in your life that you constantly give advice to and they constantly shake it off or they're always in peril or things just seem to not go right for them? They just seem to, you know, no matter how much you try – They always find a way to do badly or to do poorly, you know, and the difficult position or one of the most difficult positions to be in is to be that person who has a front row seat to someone suffering, especially somebody you care about. And I'm not speaking in terms of of physical, you know, health ailment, but in terms of simply Someone who continues to make poor life choices and doesn't see them as poor life choices. And you have to sit there or you're sitting there and watching this thing spiral downward. You already know, based on what they are going to decide to do, you already know the outcome. And no matter how badly you tried to communicate that, that to the person, to, to pass forth your knowledge, you, you start to be seen as a, you, 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 it can either be, listic, dic, I can't even say accept, because to accept it is to, to process it and to make change based on what's said. You know, so they, they may tolerate your listening, they may appreciate the attention that you give them, uh, they may appreciate the ear that you lend them, because sometimes people simply want to have somebody to complain to. But there are other times when you can become that person that they resent and they start considering you sort of a know-it-all, you know, Uh, and then they may want to start and challenge your own life decisions. And if you're not at a solid place where that's concerned, it can lead to some really tricky situations. And I want to share a story, a funny story, but, but, but I thought it was, I thought it was great. And I heard it first from uh, Dennis Kimbrough. And it's the story of the know-it-all. And it says that there was a physician, a priest, and a know-it-all. Three men who were all sentenced to death. And before, and they were sentenced to death by, by beheading, by having their heads chopped off. And before they were uh, placed inside the guillotine to have their heads chopped off, they were given a moment to... To, to confess or to, to, to make amends. And so these three men were being led to the town square where everyone was gathered to watch the beheadings. And they brought up the physician first. And they said to the physician, do you have any last words? The physician said, well, physician, heal thyself. And they gave the command for the guillotine for the blade to be dropped. And the blade stopped short of chopping off the head of the physician. Well, the townspeople who were very very religious, very, very, very superstitious people said that, well, this must be an act of God or an act from on high. So he must be an innocent man. Please let him go. So they let the physician go. So they bring up the priest and they ask the priest, uh, do you have any last words? And the priest says, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. So they give the command to the guillotine uh, worker, (laughs) and he dropped the blade, and just before it chops off the priest's neck, the blade stops. Once again, the people are in awe. They confess that this must be an act from on high, and the priest has got to be an innocent man. Let him go. So the priest has let go. 
So next, they bring up the know-it-all. They lead him up to the guillotine. They place him in position, have his arms locked in, have his head in position to be chopped off. And they say to the know-it-all, do you have any last words? The know-it-all says, yeah, you know what? If you loosen those two screws down there, this thing's going to work perfectly. So you guys know what happened to the know-it-all. And that's kind of, you know, what, what can happen sometimes when we position ourselves as a know-it-all. But let me flip back and get into the, the empathetic side of that. And the person who may be seen as a know-it-all who's being rejected, but they're coming from a very good place. And that really is the person who you're trying to give the information to who's giving you the most resistance. You know, let's be honest. It's hard to watch somebody we care about fall. It's just hard to. And I think about my days when I was in, when I was studying to become a therapist, uh, when I was at, what was I, Webster University. And I can remember one of my professors saying that when it came to clients who were difficult, he said that sometimes my job as a therapist is to help you hit rock bottom a lot faster than you would on your own. The belief in therapy, in many modes of therapy, is that real change doesn't come until a person has no choice other than to change. It doesn't come until a person hits rock bottom, you know, and what keeps people from hitting rock bottom a lot of times is that they live, they exist only inside their comfort zone. They surround themselves with people who accept who and what they are. And as I say that, let's think in terms of entertainers, of athletes. You know, God rest his soul. They say Michael Jackson. And I don't know Michael personally. But part of the story that I'm hearing and that I guess I can begin to visualize is that Michael surrounded himself with yes people. People who wouldn't challenge some of the decisions he made for fear of, well, I've garnered a, an incredible lifestyle for playing this position with Michael Jackson. And by challenging his beliefs or challenging what he does, I may be cut off, you know, and that works both ways. You know, it works both ways. And you can only imagine what happens, and not just Michael Jackson, I, I just think now in terms of many athletes, especially many young athletes, who surround themselves with entourage, with an entourage, and there are few people or sometimes no person inside that entourage who's going to have the no button ready to be pressed, you know? Because, again, people tend to surround themselves, and, and it's not everybody, but I'm talking about these cases where somebody is in peril or headed down a slippery slope. Is that you surround yourself with people who are content with who you are. They're content with what you can do for them. And they don't challenge you to be more. Okay? And not just in terms of athletes, but just regular everyday people. We don't necessarily surround ourselves. And there are, there are let me say this better. There are those of us. That don't surround us, that surround ourselves with people who are always telling us how great we are, always singing our praises, never challenging us. Sometimes that person can have that type personality where they, 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 they're sharp, they have a sharp tongue, they bite back at people, they, they tend to surround themselves with, with folks who, who, whose self esteem may be a little bit lower than theirs. Okay? And, there are times, or I think part of the reason for that, and why people surround themselves with folks who don't challenge them, and now let me take a look at the people who don't challenge, the reason why those people surround them, or one of the reasons, part of the reason, why the people surrounding this individual don't challenge them, is because if this person steps up and starts doing more and becoming more, is going to shine a light on the people who surround them. Because as long as I am in this place, you're comfortable with me. But when I step up and step out and begin living my purpose, that's going to become a problem for some. Okay? Because it's just a truth. It's just a truth of human nature that when you decide to step up 
and to step into your destiny, there's some people who are not going to be able to make that journey with you. I always thought of life as being one big sifter. And I know that's, you know, for those who don't cook, know nothing about it. A sifter is something that people would put flour into that either shake or press a lever. And it would sort of space out the flour. It would declutter or declump the flour. Okay. And so that in so many ways, or kind of like a strainer, the bigger pieces are left inside or trapped inside the, the, the webbing. And the, the, the pieces that are supposed to transfer on to the next phase are able to pass through. And I always looked at life in that way. And that happened when I got to college. And I had an opportunity to play football, took that opportunity to play football. And when I listened to the guys I was playing with or my, my soon-to-be teammates or my teammates at the time, it seemed as though, okay, all skill position people ran 4-4s four and some claimed 4-3s. And all big guys, all linemen, bench pressed 400 pounds. I didn't, but all bench 400 pounds. Everybody played in the, the state championships. Everybody was all region. Everybody got recruiting letters from across the country. I didn't. And, and everybody was the best of the best. But there are only a certain number of uniforms that the coaches are going to give out every Saturday. And there are only a certain number of people that are going to step onto the playing field. So that number is much smaller than the number of people who are there to earn a spot. So the challenges and the trials and tribulations that you were put through on the football field, or on the practice field, gave the coaches a better understanding of who can I best depend on? Who's going to be able to pass through that sifter and move on to the next phase? Okay? And so, guys, and I, I got notes. You hear my paper? So, my, my point on that again was, uh, was that sometimes the yes people, sometimes the people that surround the person of influence or of, of perceived influence, don't, don't, they don't want that person to, to, to recognize who and what they are because that would expose a light on them. That would shine a light on them, and now they've, they're going to have to work through their stuff. And most people don't want to work through their stuff because it's a challenge physically, emotionally, spiritually. It's just that. But I got to tell you, if you've got somebody in your life who challenges you, who doesn't accept average, because anybody can do average. Average is easy. But when you've got people in your life who don't accept average, it may not be until years later that you realize that you had something special. Just think about it. Those teachers, those coaches, those people in your life that are now not necessarily around you within your circle, those that challenge you the most, and I got to believe this for anybody who's truly successful or truly regards themselves as really being on that road to success, it was the people who challenged your comfort level, who challenged what you thought was your best, that really helped make you become a better person. I can remember at Garrett High School, there was a, a math teacher, an algebra, I had algebra, Doc, Dr. Ford, Miss Ford, Miss Octavia Ford. I remember her vividly. Miss Ford had a long standing reputation, and that was for being hard nosed, and her reputa the reputation amongst the students is she was a mean lady. And when I got into Miss Ford's class, I can remember having one of my friends petitioning got his mom to get him out of that class because he just didn't want to deal with her attitude well my mom was a teacher and there was no way i could come home and say i don't want to be in her class because everybody else said she's mean that didn't fly in my house she wasn't going for it my mama wasn't going for it so i went to miss ford's class but you know what i realized was that and he was he was the worst thing about miss ford's class you were given, you were made to solve your algebraic problems on the board in front of the class. Now, to an adult, that sounds right. But to a 14-year-old, to a 15-year-old, being made to stand up in front of your peers. And the thing about Ms. Ford was, you were going to stay at the board until you got that problem right. Now, to a teenage child, 
that seems like the meanest thing in the world because your peers are back there snickering. They're going to laugh at you when you leave class. They're going to laugh at you in the lunchroom. It's just an embarrassing situation. But my adult brain, when it processed that very thing, said that Miss Ford was giving you an opportunity to work through your fears. And when you became confident in your ability to solve the algebraic equations, going to the board was nothing. And when you became confident within yourself, her putting that pressure on you wasn't taken personally because she may have said a couple of things to rattle you, but I learned how to laugh it off. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. No, I don't understand. Yes, ma'am. Well, I'll work it again. Yes, ma'am. It was me being humble that helped get me through that situation. But I can look back at it and say, I really appreciate the pressure that she put on me. And I talked a bit about that type of pressure in an earlier podcast. When you are in a safe, controlled environment and you are challenged, that is where you are supposed to be able to learn. That's where you're going to learn. And I got to tell you, I know for a fact that the, num- that, that the people who butted heads with Ms. Ford probably look back now and wish that they had somebody like that in their lives and wish that they had paid more attention to the Miss Fords that came around in their lives that challenged them, that made them stand tall through their fears and go past it and go through what they were afraid of and reach the end goal. Those people are priceless. They're priceless. Again, I've got notes. <laughs> All right. And so as I make my final approach in this week's podcast, I want to say again, on one hand, nobody likes to know it all. On a second hand, you know, it's just difficult. Don't 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 despise those who you turn who you deem as know-it-alls because all of them aren't just that way. Some people who you consider know-it-alls truly have your best interest in mind and they want to share what they know. But to a person who has knowledge, I think that a part of your own maturity is learning how to share that information. And without question, that information will never be disputed or seen as a negative when someone comes to you and asks for your help. When someone asks for your help, that's when they're open. That's when they're ready to receive. The problem, though, is it's difficult to stand around and wait for somebody to get to that point. But oftentimes, that's the only way that they're going to receive it is when they ask for it. Hey, guys, this is Lou Riley signing off. want to remind you to please go to iTunes, subscribe to my podcast, type in Lou Riley Live in iTunes, you pull up my podcast. If you're on a a mobile phone, there are a number of different podcast apps that you can download uh, my podcast into, especially right now concerning the iPhone. I'll have information for those who have uh, Android-based tablets or, or what have you in the near future. But again, you you can be you can you can have it programmed where you can download whenever I release a new podcast, it's automatically downloaded onto your device. And I love listening to podcasts when I'm on my way to work or when I'm driving home or when I'm in the car riding around town. I love talk radio. It gives me a chance for my mind to process because I'm at that age now where Sometimes the radio stations, I, I just can't take it. It's just, it's just a bit much for me with the music that's being played, uh, especially when I'm in a mode for, when I'm in a mode for having my mind stimulated. You know, this is exercise for the brain. So guys, this is Lou Riley signing off with another episode. I hope that this added a little something more to, to your day. Thank you for tuning in and I will see you guys in the next episode. Take care. <laughs>